Welcome to the Perspective Doctor Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Pre-med and medical students alike are encouraged to tune in each week for tips on how to become a strong med school candidate, gain acceptance into the school of your dreams, and succeed on your journey toward residency and becoming a doctor. Hello, everyone. It's Arkita here, and I have a very special guest that some of you guys may be familiar with. It's med school coach's own Sam Smith. So he's the host of the MCAT Basics, and today we're going to do something different where he's going to be the guest, and we're going to talk about his experience in applying for med school. So Sam, do you want to tell the audience members who may not have listened to MCAT Basics or know who you are a little bit about yourself? Sure, yeah, of course, and I appreciate that uh, introduction. Um, So... (laughs) Yeah, so I started this MCAT Basics podcast, I think it was about three years ago now, um, and it's, it's really grown pretty, pretty big from what, it, uh, what, I've, what I ever thought it would be in, in what it started out as in the beginning. Um, you know, I just started it in my garage as kind of, you know, a fun little side project, a little hobby that I was doing. Um, and, and they're like, I, I record about hour-long lectures on just different MCAT topics. And, um, you know, students, I think I've found it helpful for the most part, and it's something that I've loved doing. And um, I've actually been doing it pretty much full time now for the past year, which is just insane. I would have never thought that, you know, talking in front of a microphone, I would be doing (laughs) for, for, uh, for a job, but it's been fun. That's awesome. Yeah, times have definitely changed. And there are so many different things out there that people can do. Uh, even with a passion of medicine, like we both have, where mm-hmm. you can work on your other skill sets and, and kind of explore those things. So it's super interesting. And, and I'm sure that all of the listeners out there who have listened to MCAT Basics definitely appreciate you because I know, I'm, I hate to say like way back when, <laughs> but when <laughs> I was in school, we did not have a podcast at all. For, <laughs> so this is this is definitely a, a resource for people and in, in kind of hitting on different learning styles. Definitely. So um, we have some exciting news. You recently uh, successfully got some invitations to join medical school this year after the process. So we want to dive deeply into that experience for the listeners who may be going through that process uh, next year or in the fall. Mm -hmm. Um, So I want to start by kind of asking a question you've probably heard on a lot of interviews, to be honest, but what made you decide to enter the field of medicine? So I, I originally actually was studying engineering in, in undergrad, and that's the, the direction I thought I wanted to go. Um, but, you know, I had this opportunity one summer to work in an emergency room, and my mom was, has been a wound care nurse her whole life. And so I, I had that seed kind of planted in my head of, you know, medicine might be a way I wanted to go. And I had that internship, and I really just loved it. And I was kind of, you know, energized by the experience in going in and being able to talk to people. And uh, that's kind of what shifted me t- towards a career in medicine was just that face-to-face interaction. Um, m- my twin brother, I have a twin brother. I don't know if many people know that uh, just listening to my, to my podcast. <laughs> I have a so. twin brother. He, he, is, he studied chemical engineering as well. And he actually went into, like he went into to the field. And um, I don't mean to talk down about engineering because it's, it's a great career and a lot of people love it. But he works with big metal tanks all day. I mean, he just... Um, it is modeling fluid flow through these tanks and, and, you know, doing math related to the reactions that are going on in these tanks. And to me, I just don't think I would find that as fulfilling, you know, as working with people and trying to, you know, heal people. And so uh, and that was kind of why I went in, in, into medicine was really just because of, because of that face-to-face interaction and being able to, you know, heal people and really help people. That sounds very cliche. No, <laughs> it, sounds like it, extremely it does cliche. sound cliche, but it's honest and true. Like we all have different thoughts about what our future holds. So mm-hmm. you and your brother, are obviously your twins, uh, shame on you for not mentioning that to me before, <laughs> but 
<laughs> you, you, you spent your whole life together. So I'm sure there was some component of you both thinking that you wanted to do the same thing. But when you got there and you were you were experiencing it, you did it in undergrad, you realized, hey, this isn't for me. It's time to pivot mm-hmm. and figure out what I want to do. And that's one thing that I say to a lot of students in terms of joining medicine. A lot of people get stuck, especially with the typical personality of a medical student who's kind of type A. We, we kind of live by timelines and and checklists and points and things like that, where I need to do this, then I need to do this, then I need to go to medical school. And life doesn't always work that way. So it's Mm -hmm. good to experience life and to figure out like, hey, I'm trying this. I don't like it. My heart's still in medicine. Because I always tell the students, if there's anything you can think about besides being a doctor, do that first and then come back. So that seems like what I've heard that from people too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So true. I've heard that advice. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a lot of my colleagues in med school. I I went through a pathway program, so I kind of went straight through, but I kind of felt a little disadvantaged because when I got there, there were engineers, there were people who were bankers, there were people who did so many different things. And you mm-hmm. can use those things that you learn kind of in your other life and apply it in a different way in medicine. So I think it is definitely an asset to, to try other stuff. Mm-hmm. So... Um, this is not your first time applying to medical school, which is very common. It happens to, I'm not going to throw a percentage out there because then you guys are going to go and Google it, but a large majority (laughs) of our students. Fact check. (laughs) Yeah, don't fact check. Fact check false. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, this is not your first time. So can you tell us about your first time applying in the last cycle and what that was like and what happened? Yeah, sure. So I applied, yeah, as you said, I applied in 2020, a year ago, um, and I didn't get in. And it was, it it really, really sucked. Um, You know, so just to give a little bit of background, and I want people, you know, I'll try to be as open as possible here and just kind of, you know, give people my stats and and, and just show them where I'm at. Mm -hmm. Um, So on the MCAT, I got a 513, and then my GPA was a 3.82. Now, that might not mean a whole lot to you because I don't know, you're not, are you on an admissions committee? Not now, but and I will show my age right now and and say that the MCATs were not scored in the hundreds when I was right. It was like it. was that when they're like you know thirty two or something mm-hmm. was a, a good score, so, right? We didn't have hundreds, so, but yes. Okay, so anyways, that's you know it's it's a it's a decent mm-hmm. um it's a decent MCAT score. It's a decent GPA. It should be enough to get you into uh, medical school. And so you know my thoughts going into the application cycle were basically. Um, you know, I had a shot at every single program that had a, a, an average MCAT and average GPA that was in my range. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a lot of people's, you know, thinking as you're going into a cycle is like, hey, I'm going to get so many interviews because I am at this, you know, range or this average for these med schools. And, you know, that's just not how it works. So that's something, you know, right off the bat to just think about. Um, and anyway, so I applied to 26 schools. And out of those 26 schools, I got three interviews. Oh. Um, two of those three interviews were what's called the MMI format. I don't know if you're familiar with um, the, the multiple mini interview format, mm-hmm. but uh, it, those were very difficult. So basically in those, you're given a scenario or some type of question, and then uh, you walk into like a room and you have to talk to this person who's just typing on their computer as you're talking, and you don't really get to see you know, you don't, you don't get to really see a person respond to you or be human. It's like you're mm-hmm. talking to a computer and it's just, I don't know. I, I don't really love the way, I don't love how that works because, you know, when you're talking to somebody, you can read their facial expressions, you know, you can connect with them and it just is not possible in an MMI. Um, so I had two MMI interviews. I was denied like right after the interviews. Mm-hmm. And then I had one that wasn't MMI, just, you know, traditional sit down, get to know you. Um, I was waitlisted there. And eventually, um, I, I, you know, was, was denied off the wait list and it, it, it sucked. Uh, are you, are you allowed to cuss on your podcast? Yes. Show your it, fe- it felt like, it felt like shit. I felt yes. like shit because I had been working for, you know, three or four years to get to that goal of, you know, getting into med school. And so, you know, when you don't get in, it's like the, these thoughts start to come up. Like, did I, you know, pick the right thing? Mm-hmm. Am I ever going to be able to get into med school? You know, maybe this is what's going to happen every single year. Um, so I started having those thoughts, but eventually I kind of got to the point where 
I was more looking forward and started to think, okay, what can I do to improve my application? Mm -hmm. And um, I talked to just as many people as I could, put my application in front of as many people as I could and, and got their feedback on things that I could improve on and, you know, made those improvements. And I think, I, I don't know if it worked, but I mean, I got into, you know, I got into three medical schools this year, which is three more than uh, the year before. So I think some of those improvements really did help. And, you know, part of what I want to do today is just talk about, you know, some of those things that I learned and hopefully be able to help um, some students that are in, in the same position as me, or maybe, you know, just applying for the first time this year. I appreciate your transparency. And I just want to take a step back. First, I think it's adorable that you just asked me, could you curse on the podcast when you <laughs> are my producer? <laughs> <laughs> It's your okay, podcast listening out there. Sam could also bleep it out if he wants to change it. That's a good point. But, I could do that, yeah. <laughs> but I, I love the transparency. And I think what you're saying is medical school is really competitive and all of the students are amazing. So you've gotten mm -hmm. to that point. You've done those practice tests. You've studied. You killed the MCAT. You have an amazing GPA. So sometimes they're not necessarily looking for those things that are expectations when mm -hmm. you matriculate into medical school and then to have certain different interviewing techniques that certain schools look like if we're entering the field where we're supposed to value humanism it's very difficult to prepare for something where there's no interaction so so yeah. i definitely understand that you it was hard. It was rough. And like you said, it was shitty. So mm -hmm. afterwards, you didn't, the big key point to that is that you didn't sit there and sulk or give up and figure out like, okay, this isn't for me. I'm gonna go figure something else out. You set your goal and you figured out how you could network and talk with as many people as you said that you did, review your application, see how you can improve it and boost it so that you can present yourself in the best way possible in the future. And I think that that shows resilience and it shows like how you will continue to persevere during the tough times in school. Because I mentioned that I went straight through for school or whatever like that, but that doesn't mean that just because I went through straight for school that there weren't hiccups <laughs> that definitely mm -hmm. caused the same kinds of pivots. So like I, I wasn't that great at test taking. So uh, I have stories for days. We won't get into too much because <laughs> this is your time to shine. <laughs> but it's all about that, that pivoting and figuring out how to relentlessly improve yourself so that you can um, tackle it the next time. Now, and I've, I've noticed, huh? I've noticed on a lot of your, I mean, I've noticed too, on a lot of your podcasts, a lot of, a, a lot of the, the doctors that you talk to really have had, you know, points in their careers where they've had to uh, overcome things. And, you know, maybe it's not matching. Mm -hmm. um, it's not getting that fellowship that they wanted. There's, there's so many different, I feel like steps in a medical career to, to, uh, almost achieve. I, I don't know how to say that. Right. But, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many different levels of, of times where, you can, you know, not match or not get the fellowship where it does take that extra level of, of persevering. So I think that is definitely something that uh, is important to have if you're interested in going in me into medicine. Absolutely. And, and it's good that you're learning early because there, there are definitely people who come in and they have, I, for instance, I had a very great uh, close friend who came in and had really great scores, always rocked all the exams, always did such and such and such. And then they just knew they were a shoe in kind of like you kind of knew you were a shoe in last year and they didn't match. And, and everyone's like, what? Or when they took the step two CS, like they, they knew all of the things by the book, but it's kind of figuring out that way to also show your personality or on different rotations. You, there may be people who are very great surgeons and they will be that, but they're not doing well with the family medicine component or the OBGYN component or something. So there's everyone isn't going to be the best at everything, but that's why you're entering school to learn. So you're going to learn and grow and pick up different things from your colleagues and your friends and stuff. So it's definitely an opportunity for growth and, and these life experiences that you experience will help you kind of apply that to the future. Right. Yeah. 
Med School Coach, we know that studying for the MCAT exam can be challenging, especially for busy students on the go. That's why our team created MCAT Prep, the only all-encompassing study app built specifically for the MCAT. MCAT Prep by Med School Coach provides student access to extremely high-quality content and a personalized curriculum for free. The app has more than 250 videos, 1,000 flashcards, and 1,000 unique MCAT questions. Plus, MCAT Prep by Med School Coach allows students to create a personalized study schedule and track progress over time. You need every competitive advantage you can get to get into medical school, and now you can put the experts from Med School Coach into your pocket. It's the closest pre-med students can come to a personal tutor without spending a penny. Download MCAT Prep by Med School Coach for free at medschoolcoach.com slash MCAT or download it directly from the Apple Store or Google Play Store. You can achieve your medical school dreams and MCAT Prep by Med School Coach can help. So tell us about your experience this year. You mentioned that you did a lot of soul searching, you reached out to a lot of different mentors, and you figured out some things that helped improve your application. Yeah, so um, I, I kind of sat down the other day and was just thinking about really the, the kind of main improvements I made and the, the main advice I got. Um, if you have any questions on this, you can just go ahead and stop me and ask them while, while I'm going through this. But um, mm -hmm. there was kind of a few things I came up with. Number one was to really focus on the school list. So the, the first year around, I applied to 26 schools. And um, a lot of the advice that I got was of those 26 schools, I picked too many that were either a little bit too competitive for me or were mm -hmm. public schools that didn't really admit many out-of-state students. So, mm -hmm. you know, you know, I, looking back, I think that's something that I should have obviously thought more about and put more time into. Um, but this year, I applied to 30 programs and I made sure that it was a good mix of public schools and private schools um, and just really made sure that this list was schools that I really had a good shot at getting into. Um, so that was the first thing. And in this step, I think I, I, my advice to, to people would be um, make the MSAR sheet your best friend. So there's this M MSAR sheet. You may have never heard of it, but it is, uh, what does that even stand for? MSAR, Medical uh, Student, I don't know what it stands for, <laughs> unfortunately, but it's a sheet with all the facts about each school. So it's got, you know, percent of students that are out of state. It's got average MCAT. It's got average um, scores for all the subsections. And, and so just go through that. Make sure that that's like your best friend. Um, okay. And since we are in a digital age, I did a quick fact check. And <laughs> it stands for medical school admissions requirements. Nice. Thank you very much. So, yes, medical You're school uh, admissions requirements. So make that, make that your best friend. So that's number one. Another thing, and this is really important, and this is something I should have been focusing on years before the application, was just getting more clinical experience. So this was mm -hmm. probably the second most common thing I heard about my application was I just didn't have enough clinical experience. Um, and at the time when I was applying, uh, so this is going back a bit, but I was in, I, I spent two years in the DC area. I was working at the NIH doing research out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I thought that was going to be a great activity to be doing. And it was, I mean, I learned a lot and I think it was good in terms of preparing me for medicine, but I needed to be doing some kind of volunteering or some kind of something else on the side to kind of supplement with, with uh, clinical experiences, because that is super important. And I think admissions committees really look for that. Um, I got mm -hmm. lucky and I actually was able to volunteer at like a COVID screening center at the NIH while the COVID pandemic was going on. Um, so I couldn't even get into a lab but I was basically working full time at this screening center. And so it worked in a way that worked to my advantage. Um, but looking back, I should have been doing clinical volunteering, you know, for, for a year or two leading up to that application cycle. So that is the second thing. The third thing, and this is going to sound obvious, but um, the essays are super important. You know, I mm -hmm. think sometimes those get overlooked. You have this personal statement. You have, you know, three or four essays that go to each school. And not that I didn't take them seriously, it was more of the first time around, it was more of kind of just let me get these submitted as fast as I can so I'm first on the list um, for that school. I think that was a mistake. I think that um, in the end, the essays are really important. And mm -hmm. to be honest, the whole application is important. Overlooking really any aspect of it, I think is a mistake. 
But to me, the essays are the easiest thing to um, overlook. And I think more on that point, one thing that I did that I think helped me was use your personal statement to tell, like, tell your story, tell a story of why, you know, you wanted to go into medicine. Um, my story, I think, was a little more about education and, you know, some of the things I've done in the education space that make me excited about medicine. And, and, and through that, I was able to tell about a lot of my different experiences in medicine. Um, so be able to tell a story about, you know, why you want to go into medicine. Uh, the first time around, I think my essay was a bit more of just, you know, here's this experience, here's this experience, here's this experience, and didn't really tie everything together with a story. Um, second time around, it was more, uh, more story related. Um, I love this. And then one more, and this one is uh, another kind of obvious one, but I think one that looking back, I really regret by the first time around is that, you know, treat every interview as though you're literally going to get one interview. Um, I went in and this is just, you know, this is just probably a bit of arrogance, but I went in thinking, okay, you know, my first interview was with a school that I thought, you know, was maybe a, a little bit of a safety school. And so I was thinking, you know, uh, I'm going to I'm going to take this interview as, as like a practice interview. And this is going to be great for my interviews later on. Well, I ended up only having three interviews. And so, you know, I could have really uh, prepared really well for that interview and maybe, you know, gotten into that school. Um, but I, I, out of probably a bit of arrogance, I, I didn't do that. So this year, I really focused on, you know, this might be my own only interview. And so I, mm -hmm. I, I really prepared for that and really made sure I know my stuff. Um, and then, you know, went into the interview feeling more confident than I did the year before. Um, and, and I really did feel like I could really connected with the interviewer a, a lot better this cycle. And I think that's another important thing is really just trying to connect to, to the interviewer. So, you know, on, upon reflection, those are kind of the main things that uh, just came up in my mind as things that I learned and things that I improved um, to improve my application this time around. I think that that is an amazing list and it was full of re thoughtfulness and reflection. And I think that it's worth us restating again. So I wrote them down. So I'll, I'll nice. kind of restate Sam's yeah, five point, uh, points of application. So number one, focus on your school list because that's mm -hmm. important. You have to be realistic and look at your stats because they're all individual and what you're looking for in a school and what a school may be looking for in you. Number two, look at that MSAR sheet. To, again, that's the medical school admissions requirement sheet, and it can tell you a lot of things about the school. Three, clinical and volunteer experience is important, and I will say that as someone who previously has helped with admissions both in medical school and residency, um, and even now in other organizations, that point where you're not doing any work for money that is required, it kind of shows your passion and your drive and why you want to do it. Like you're showing up there. We want to make sure that you know what you're getting into. So if you're volunteering at doctor's office, you're able to see and engage with different patients. And even if you're not taking care of them, you can evaluate and have some kind of insight as to the demand of the field. And then volunteerism, it just is a part of that altruistic part of medicine where you're giving back to the community. So it could be something formal like the COVID testing that Sam did, or it could be volunteering at a homeless shelter or doing big siblings. Some people do Girl Scouts. It's, it's, what your passion is. So don't do it just to check off a box because people can kind of read that as mm -hmm. well, but do something that you're passionate about that will actually give you some experience in, in giving back. Um, number four, the essays. I think that is definitely a great point to bring up. Don't breeze through them. I'm sure that the, the many schools kind of definitely probably looked a lot at your application. That is what gets you the interview. And it, it's the only way that they can see who you are outside of your scores. So it's your time to shine. So I like to tell people, like Sam said, tell your story. So I use the, the W. So who you are, what you do or what you did to why you did it. So like, why did you volunteer for COVID? If you did a story on like how the pandemic affected your life and drove you to want to pursue medicine even more. Um, and 
what you want to do. So say you want to be an orthopedic surgeon, like why do you want to do it? So they'll know what your passion is, not just I want to help people because everybody wants to help people and you can help people in different ways outside of medicine. Um, and why should they choose you? So they have thousands of applications. So in that with your like your plea, your ending statement, like you're in court, like please not please choose me, but <laughs> Choose me because I will add this to your school. Yeah. When I'm a graduate of your school, you will um, blah, 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 and blah. I will impact society in this way. So tell them why they should choose you, basically, and, and shine there. And then number five, be humble and, and treat this as your only interview because you never know. It may be your only interview or you may, after you go back and get several um, acceptances have to kind of make a, a checklist of pros and cons. And you may think back on that interview and be like, okay, I didn't think I would love that place. But now where I'm at this other school, I got an interview at, I think I like this other one more. So always have a uh, show, put your best foot forward. Yep, definitely. And I should, so, I should clarify, I should clarify too, um, just for the listener. So um, this year I had seven interviews and none of them were MMI. So I don't know if that had anything to do with it, just performance in, in MMI in general. But, um, you know, I, I do think there were, I do think that some of these changes I made uh, really did, you know, help. I went from three interviews to seven. I think there was something that changed um, that, that, that really did help. So hopefully that gives it a little legitimacy. That is absolutely phenomenal. I'm going to be really, really, really transparent today and say for medical school, I think I got two interviews. Um, so, so these numbers may sound very small mm -hmm. when we think about the number of applications that you send out and how wonderful your package is. But like we are reiterating over and over again, medical school is very competitive and definitely try to maximize your application and showcase your thankfulness with wherever you interview. Yeah, definitely. Yes. So one thing we didn't hit on, because I know we're, we're, we're coming towards the end, but we, we kind of didn't talk about the elephant in the room as this past year was the pandemic. Right. So how did that affect your interviews this year as we Definitely don't know how the fall will look in terms of interviews moving forward. Yeah, so one, th I, I think it was fantastic compared, you know, so I, I was able mm -hmm. to go through a year of, you know, non-COVID interviews and then COVID interviews. I, th I think it was fantastic that they did a lot of the interviews, um, you know, over Zoom. Now, Zoom obviously is not as great as being in person. However, in terms of money that I saved, I mean, it's just... I probably saved five or six grand. It's just, it costs so much to fly to all these places, get hotels, um, you know, do all the things. Whereas if you could do it all from your office, literally where I'm at now, you know, you save all that money. So I think that this virtual interview is really the way that it's going to be done in the future. And um, that question was actually asked quite a bit by students at interviews. And a lot of the schools actually said that they're going to stay with this virtual interview format. Mm -hmm. So I think that's great. Um, but again, it, it, it's not uh, one difficulty of that is that you don't get to see the schools. So mm -hmm. um, which which in a way is fine because, you know, I don't know what the stats are, but let's say that somewhere around, you know, 10 to 50 percent of people, depending on the school that get interviewed, get in. So. I think it's almost better that once you know where you got in at, that's when you can go visit the schools and that's when you can see, um, you know, what the campus is like, et cetera. And I think that's what some schools are going to be doing is having second looks that are mm -hmm. in person so you can see campus. So I guess my overall take on it would be hopefully a lot of schools remain with the, with the virtual interview setup. Um, however, it's good to see campus, meet students, meet faculty. So if you have the opportunity through a second look, I totally recommend doing that. Absolutely. With, and this is just a, a question that came off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. So it, bear with me if you need <laughs> to think about it a little bit. With this, 
way of interviewing. Did you have an opportunity to connect with the other students who were currently at the schools where you interviewed to kind of have a conversation with them outside of a Zoom? Um, not really. That's another problem is, so they, a, a lot of the interviews did have like student panels. And so you could talk to some of the students, you know, kind of unfiltered, get to hear what they said, but it wasn't really a one-on-one -on -one and it wasn't really, um, you know, it wasn't really being able to fully connect. So mm -hmm. what I did in, in trying to kind of choose the, the medical school that I'm going to go to is just reach out to different students that you can find on LinkedIn or that are friends of friends. Um, and, and just talk about the schools, talk about the culture, talk about, you know, what the other students are like. Um, I think that gives a, a better kind of idea of what this school feels like or what it would feel like to go there as a student. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad that you brought up that point. So utilize your resources. We're living in a social media, digital age. Mm -hmm. So once you narrow your list or if you want more information, those students are living it. So it's very good to talk to someone who is currently in that environment to see what the culture is like, to see if there is a uh, camaraderie or very competitive. So there, there are certain stereotypes for certain schools. So to right. see what type of environment you would thrive in with your classmates. Like I know some of my fondest memories from medical school were those times after tests. So in my second year, I think we had exams every two weeks. And every two weeks, about 150 out of the 180 of us were at the bars <laughs> or at somewhere. Awesome. So we had a lot of team building outside of yeah. studying and, and figuring out like what it is like to live in the area. What is the cost of living? And all of those things that may factor into your decision. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely advantages to being in person like that. Um, but I think on balance, the, the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. Absolutely. Um, I'm sure with seven interviews, you may have had to narrow down or, or something yeah. if it was in person, like they may have been conflicts with time. Right now, you probably can have one interview back to back or the day after, mm -hmm. whereas opposed to flying and all of those costs and different things may have been more prohibitive. So yeah. Yeah. definitely pluses and minuses, but I'm glad that we were able to kind of go through some of the reflection of both of your experiences with the interview cycle. And now you've come out on the other side. So mm -hmm. I'm sure after your first year starts in the fall, I'll have you back and you can tell everybody like, okay, study this anatomy. <laughs> so, <laughs> I would be happy. We'll, we'll, we'll grow into like first year basics yeah. or something. So it'll be, be very interesting. I'd be happy to do that. Um, and one thing I want to say too, before I leave is, you know, there's, I'm sure there's some people out there that are going through the same thing. Maybe you applied this cycle and just didn't get in. Um, go mm -hmm. find something cool to do for a year. You know, I got to be a, a full-time podcaster. I got to live with my girlfriend who's a law student. I don't think I would have got to do that otherwise. Um, there's a lot of good things that came out of not getting in. And of course, that's looking back in retrospect. Now that I have gotten in, I might feel different if I didn't get in again. But, mm -hmm. you know, use that time to go do something cool that's going to build up your application, something that you're, you're passionate about and that you're going to love doing. Absolutely. And, and life happens when it's supposed to happen. Yeah. So if you're meant to be a doctor, you're going to be a doctor. You're going to be OK. So there, there are definitely people who, like I said, got in the first time. There are people who got in the second time. There are people who have been trying for years and they get in and they may take a break and do another job and come back to it because the passion is still there. I think if you guys listen to one of my episodes a few weeks back where we were talking with Dr. Kat Chamberlain and she was talking about how she thought about medicine and then she ended up doing like the Peace Corps for like five or six years and then coming back and then she had to do her prerequisites. So it took her about 10 years to go to medical school. And now she's thriving. So just because things don't happen on the first attempt or on the timeline that you want them to happen, there are a lot of great things that can come out of it. Like Sam just told you about all of the amazing things that he's been doing this past year. So I'm sure you guys will continue to thrive and you guys can definitely write us in um, to Med School Coach or go on our Instagram or even um, mine or Sam's um, and let us know 
um, what other topics you would like to listen to, or if you would like for us to have another conversation on something, uh, we're definitely listening. Yeah, definitely. And my, um, I, I can put my email out there too. If anybody has, you know, questions mm-hmm. about reapplying um, or anything like that, I'm happy to answer. My email is just sam at mcatbasics.com. So again, feel free to reach out. Always happy to answer questions. Well, thank you so much. It was such a delight to have you talk about this experience today. I think that you um, were our inaugural guest to say shit. (laughs) Yes, that's what I was going for. (laughs) That was my goal this whole time. (laughs) (laughs) We'll see what kind of good trouble we get into. So all the listeners out there, definitely click that subscribe button and Also subscribe to MCAT Basics if you're still in that process. And I'll see you guys next week. Yep. See ya. Thank you. Each episode of the Perspective Doctor podcast is brought to you by Med School Coach. To access articles, videos, webinars, and free tools to help you succeed on your journey toward med school and beyond, visit our website, perspectivedoctor.com. We hope you tune in again next time.